welcome to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. And now your host, Tim Johnson. Welcome to the final show of our ninth season. We'll talk to Paul Tibbetts IV, former Deputy Commander of the U.S. Air Force Global Strike Command, when we return on this edition of the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. Louisiana Businesses, by partnering with your local community and technical college foundation, you're guaranteed a skilled, highly competent workforce, homegrown talent, trained specifically to meet your needs, whatever those needs are. Visit this website to learn more about how to partner with your local Louisiana Community and Technical College Foundation. To better prepare for tomorrow, become a partner today. Before you hire someone to work on your home or business, protect yourself. Go to LAContractor.org and make sure he or she is licensed in Louisiana. That's LAContractor.org for a list of over 26,000 licensed contractors. It's your money. Make wise decisions and protect yourself. Growing up in Baton Rouge, I used to always pass up ExxonMobil, but I never thought that I would actually have the opportunity to get on. But what I thought was impossible turned out to be possible. So I just feel like it's just a wonderful opportunity to be able to provide for my family. We are committed to being a community partner. We are actively working to recruit the talent here in Baton Rouge, and we want to bring them into our workforce. We're ready. Louisiana has over 26,000 licensed companies that do business legally and meet the needs of our state. Before selecting a contractor, check references and verify the license at lacontractor.org. It's your money. Make wise decisions and protect yourself from being scammed. For eight seconds in the arena before an afternoon in the field. For a promise to students that honors success in the classroom. For championships earned on the bayou. For innovators committed to reclaiming our coastline. The Universities of Louisiana. For your future. For our future. Welcome back to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. I've been looking forward to this episode for some time. A new friend, Paul Tibbetts IV, former Deputy Commander of the United States Air Force Global Strike Command, is my guest buddy. Welcome. Tim, thank you. It's definitely an honor to be here and I appreciate the time. Well, um, today's show is going to be a little different from what we've done uh, over the course of the last few years, but I think very interesting. We're going to talk about your very distinguished military career as we go along. But when you and I first met, you came to my office and we were having a meeting and I was trying to recognize the name, Paul Tibbetts. How do I know that name? How do I know that name? I ask you the question, and you said to me, maybe this will help, Tim. My great-grandmother's name was Enola Gay. Your grandfather, Paul Warfield Tibbetts Jr., flew the Enola Gay that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. What a family legacy. And so let's start there. I want to talk about your grandfather, his career, your relationship with him, and just what you remember, Paul. Tell the story. I'd love to, Tim. Thank you. You know, it, first of all, uh, and, I, and I sincerely mean this, it's an honor to be a Paul Tibbetts, to be able to talk about my grandfather. Uh, a true hero and uh, without a doubt my hero, you know, of all time. Uh, he, this man, you know, he grew up as a, as a humble, just young man of a, of a father who ran some grocery stores and sold confectioners. Uh, not military necessarily, a little bit of time in World War I, his father, but that was it. So my grandfather had a passion for flying. That was his thing, and he said, he told me, he said, Paul, all I ever really wanted to do was fly airplanes. And the, uh, so he, he said, a soldier, to be in the military was a way to get to that goal. And I always say, aren't we glad he did? But as a youngster, when he was uh, not even a teenager yet, 12 years old, uh, my, his father hired a barnstormer to, and this is you know, God off the truth here, deliver a brand new candy bar called the Baby Ruth over a sporting event. And my grandfather begged and begged and begged and said, you know, Dad, please let me fly in this airplane. Because he needed somebody with him to toss out the candy bars. And uh, he didn't have anybody. He always used to just find somebody. And my grandfather was like, or his great, my great grandfather, his father said, no, 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 Paul, that's not something. And he, he, he was close to his mom, Enola Gay. He said, hey, Mom, what do you think? She goes, well, let me work on it. The rest is history. He was hooked. Well, you know, you go from 
having this desire as a young child to, to, to be in the military or actually to, to fly airplanes and, and use the, the path through the military. You go from dropping baby Roos with a barnstormer to being the guy who is put in command of over 2,000 men, and he leads the mission to drop little boy on Hiroshima. Uh, what an incredible story that is. And you think about him wanting to be a pilot at a very young age when aircraft were probably very primitive at the time, right? A relatively new invention, right? Uh, what do you think led him to, to have that desire? Where did that come from, Paul? You know, he, I talked to my grandfather a long time. His father wanted him to be a doctor. And he said, look, Paul, I was fascinated with airplanes. Just fascinating. You know, every, kids grow up and we all have our desires, right? That was his passion. And so there's so many things that I learned from my grandfather. But one thing I learned from him was, you know, he told me, he said, Paul, always follow your passion. Because if you don't, someday you'll probably regret it. Yeah. And so he took off. You know, he flew in this airplane. His dad said, you're going to be a doctor. And there's a lot of story there, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of sum up this initial part with, with this kind of phrase. He said, Paul, I was going to do everything I could to be a pilot. And so when he was in college, he went through a couple years, he was heading to medical school, and one day he called his mom and he said, Mom, I'm dropping out of school, I'm gonna be a pilot. Uh, you he's think dead. about that, and he yeah. became what is clearly today one of the most famous pilots in American yes, Air sir. Force history, right? I mean, if you think about that, uh, Chuck Yeager, Paul Tibbetts, those, those names come to top of mind. Because I'm a history nerd, just within the last few days, I watched an hour-long YouTube interview that former President Richard Nixon conducted shortly after he left office, sort of in disgrace. But he talked about his relationship with Harry Truman. And he talked about the fact that Harry Truman made the very difficult human decision to drop this first atomic bomb, and your grandfather flew that mission. But what struck me was President Nixon said that there is no question in his mind but that that bomb saved a million lives. Um, that had to be something your grandfather was proud of, too. It was, Tim. And, you know, there, there's three reasons that I can really give you as, as, a, as a summary of why he was selected. People always go, you know, what's not in the books or what was going on yeah. with your grandfather? Yeah. Why was he selected for this? He was a gifted aviator. He was number one in his pilot training class. He said, Paul, always work hard, right? He worked hard. He knew he was going to be a pilot, and he knew he was, he got in there, was talented. He said, but I gave it all I had. Yeah. Number one, wanted to fly bombers. And he succeeded at that. When the war started, he started, he started flying B-17s, and he stood up a squadron from bare bones and operated out of North Africa, really made a name for himself. Ended up with two distinguished flying crosses because of his time in Europe flying B-17s. Talented aviator you know, very talented aviator. Went back to the States and had to fly the uh, B-29. Didn't want to leave the war. His boss, Jimmy Doolittle, a lot of people know that name, said, Paul, you're going back. And we're, we need our best to figure out what's going on with this B-29 and get it ready to go and ready for combat because they knew they needed this bomber for the end of the war. And thirdly, they needed a pilot who, and a, and a, and a person who could kind of start with something and end up with greatness, right? Go do something. And, and my grandfather was known for that. He was known for solving problems. He was known for creating something out of nothing. And so he was the guy. And so although a lieutenant colonel, he led the 509th Composite Group, which organized and trained the crews to drop the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Truly, the rest is history. We're going to take a break. We come back. I want to talk a little bit more about your grandfather's legacy, because one of the things that was very interesting to me is I think that there was some question leading right up to the time of the mission as to whether he would actually fly, be the, be the lead pilot on that mission. It's just so fascinating. also want to talk about his book as well. We're visiting with Paul Tibbetts IV, and you're watching the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. Shell, the rhythm of Louisiana. As humankind faces its most critical challenges yet, the world demands leaders, and LSU is taking up the charge. The research we do here goes everywhere to protect communities threatened by climate change so you can live your life with fewer worries about tomorrow. We're formulating a better way 
for everyone. Because at LSU, our calling is humanity. Plants would not be operating if they weren't operating under the regulations to keep everybody safe and keep the environment safe. It also goes back to the end products that our raw materials go into. Solar panels, windmills, reusable bottles. Primary product is acrylonitrile, which is used to make carbon fiber. Carbon fiber in an airplane is used to make it lighter. By reducing weight, we indirectly help the environment because it uses less fuel. And for us to make products that help reduce carbon footprints is a big deal. Shell, the rhythm of Louisiana. So, how can I help you today? Maybe you're looking for a bigger home. Maybe you have plans to grow your business. Or maybe all your plans have just changed. For the better. Whether you're planning for the future or just looking for a bank that cares about you. If you have a goal, let's make it happen. Welcome back to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. We're visiting with Paul Tibbetts IV. He is the former Deputy Commander of the U.S. Air Force Global Strike Command and grandson of Paul Warfield Tibbetts Jr., who flew the Enola Gay over Hiroshima in 1945. Can't wait to dive into this book, yes, your sir. grandfather's book. But I have read a lot about the mission and the history of the mission. And one of the things that struck me was, after your grandfather had commanded the lead up to the mission, right? He had developed it. He was the, the sort of the, the, the commander in charge, a great presence, mapping this whole thing out. There was some question as to whether he would actually fly the Enola Gay that, that day. And he sort of put his foot down and said, no, this is critically important. I've developed this up to this point. I'm going to be the lead pilot. I'm going to be in the cockpit. This is too, too important to the nation and to our security. Talk about that story a little bit, Paul, and, and what you know maybe behind the scenes. Yeah, thanks, Tim. So my grandfather, uh, he's a very confident man. Um, he made the comment one day, he said, sometimes I needed a little more tact in my life, but this is wartime. You got to get the job done. And uh, this was specialized training. We know, we, I want your listeners to know that you know, th they were training for a very unique and special mission that required a lot of special tactics. Whole another story, a lot more information there, but just take my word that you, know, you can't just pick up another group and go fly it. They spent months and months preparing for this. And my grandfather developed a lot of the tactics that they were using. On this day, there was a gentleman that was a little jealous of what was happening, and he went to General LeMay and said, hey, General, uh, it looks like, you know, we've got some more experienced pilots here that could probably lead this mission. You know, the 509th, they're not flying in the war, they're just training. We need people, that kind of thing. And my grandfather had learned from a mistake, a mistake he made in the past. And he was ready to go talk to General May and with tact, approach it and explain to General May, you know, General, it's, it's a complicated mission. It requires a lot of preparation and training. General LeMay was prepared to turn this mission over to another organization. And it was actually right there, ready to happen until he spoke to my grandfather. And I always said, I always told granddad, I said, so what were you thinking? He goes, well, he said, I recognize that I can be a little abrasive. And I went in there ready to explain this in a diplomatic way, even though I'm not necessarily a very political kind of guy. He said, I knew I had to make General LeMay comfortable. And he looked him in the eye and he said, General, I'm going to fly this mission. You'll have experience on board. You don't have a thing to worry about. And there it is. There and it the is. rest, as they say, is history. Yes, sir. At what point in your life, Paul, could you clearly recognize the significance of what your grandfather had done? And what has that meant to you and your life and your career? I went to the Air Force Academy. Uh, my grandfather told me the day before, a week or so before I left, he looked at me in the eye and he's, he came to visit me. And I hadn't seen him much growing up. He was a busy man leading an organization that was flying airplanes after the war, I mean, after the Air Force. And he said, Paul, just be yourself. People are going to know you, but you just be you. So I got to the Air Force Academy and I thought, okay, I can do that. Running around the halls, doing our thing, getting trained. You know, the first year is like basic training at the Academy. So the second year I get to my new squadron and the upperclassman comes up to me and says, Paul Tibbetts. I know who you are. And I'm like, remember what granddad said? Remember what granddad said? 
uh, yes, just honored to, to be here and, you know, that kind of thing. He says, we got to come up with a call sign for you. Well, my dad was an army medic. I don't know what a call sign is. You know, I'm like, call sign. He goes, and anyway, in the end, a few weeks later, he looks at me, he goes, I got it. We're going to call you Nuke Jr. Nuke Jr. And I thought, that's pretty funny. That's good. Nuke Jr. That's anyway, the rest, you know, could, you, you can develop that later. But the bottom line is, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, this is real. Yeah. I mean, these guys are like, you know, this is granddad and I know what he did, but I haven't really engaged like this before. Right. I need to learn a little bit more myself. Right. And but that started it off right there. Do you think that because he was family and because he was your grandfather, that maybe the perspective of the others who were in your academy class saw things maybe or held him at maybe a, a higher level of esteem or or, you know, clearly recognize the critical importance and the impact that he had had. I mean, what, what's that dynamic? Yeah, and what does it mean to me? You asked me about right. that. You know, so this, as this plays out, I learned pretty quickly that what my grandfather told me was really important. Be yourself. And I did for a long time. They, it, it, was, it was that big of a deal because this is the man with his organization. And he always said, it's not me, it's the team. Right. But this is the team that brought that war to an end, along with a lot of other things that were happening at the same time. As we talked about, a million lives right. saved. And he said, Paul, just be yourself. So yes, I recognize that. But what it meant to me was that I went 20 years in my military career without really talking about my grandfather. And real quickly, one day, a friend of mine walked up. I'm a colonel now at a developmental course for leadership. And he looks at me and he goes, Paul, by the way, you know, so cool to see you again. You know, we haven't seen you in a long time. Your granddad, all that. So cool. Why don't you ever talk about him? And he's looking at me and I said, what do you mean? He goes, you never talk about him. I said, and I told him the story that we just shared here. And he goes, I got it, Paul. But you know, at this point, my grandfather had passed away. He said, you're the one that's got to carry on the legacy. We want to hear the stories. We want to hear about your grandfather. And it clicked. Yeah. I said, okay, I got it. So that's what happened to me. And from that point forward, I made it a vow to myself and to my grandfather that I, whenever I have the chance to speak, if I'm given the opportunity to talk to the public about how great our military is and the wonderful things that our airmen are doing, I'll, I'll mention my grandfather and what an honor it is to have known him and what he did for our country. And those those values that both very directly and by your own study of history, he was able to instill in you. Yes, sir. Really, really important. Let's take a break. I want to come back. I want to talk about your own very distinguished military career. We're visiting with Paul Tibbetts IV. You're watching the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. Welcome back to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. Paul Tibbetts IV is our guest. Your grandfather, uh, Paul Warfield Tibbetts Jr., as we've talked about over the course of the show, 
flew the Enola Gay over Hiroshima in 1945, and you made the conscious decision to follow in his footsteps. And you have distinguished yourself in your own military career, and I want to read some of this. We mentioned that you are the former deputy commander of the U.S. Air Force Global Strike Command. You were also the commander of the 509th Bomb Wing, a unit that your grandfather had commanded years ago. Paul, I can only assume that it's not easy to follow a legend, a historical legend like your grandfather, but you did it and you distinguished yourself. Talk about your own military career, the highlights you believe you uh, accomplished, and, and how your grandfather sort of shaped your approach to that work. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Yeah, it was really an honor. I remember my grandfather giggling, at, you know, a bit excited when I told him I wanted to go into the Air Force, and that's when he came and spoke to me and, and gave me some advice, and, and we talked for a little bit. But, the, you know, I had the opportunity to lead airmen through various assignments, including squadron command with the 383rd Bomb Squadron, which was my grandfather's squadron that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. The 5-9th Bomb Wing, what an honor to take care of our great men and women that are serving in our Air Force today. It was fantastic. But what, what my grandfather kind of imparted on me and how that played out in my career, I think, you know, really, it did really shape me. And, you know, a couple things that he told me. One day we were out at the B-2 and I was giving him a tour. It was early in my early days of the B-2. And I said, hey, Granddad, wouldn't you like to go fly in this airplane? And uh, he goes, nah. And I went, he goes, no. I said, well, can we get in the sim? He goes, okay. You know, but he said, he said, Paul, look, he said, I just got to understand that what we have is in our society, in, in, in the U.S. today, that we maintain the edge, that we maintain that advantage. And he looked at me and he said, Paul, you know, you're part of a team now. I was part of a team. And this idea of team was what he was really, you know, kind of focusing on. And, and it really drove home to me the importance of what we do together, right, as, a, as an organization and as an Air Force. And, and that really played out strongly as a squadron commander where I don't think I developed our command team throughout the wing as well. I kind of learned from that. And when I became a wing commander, uh, it really gave me the opportunity because, you know, you think about you have a whole city you're in charge of now when you're on a base because wing commander is a base commander. And my grandfather said, remember, take care of all of that team. We had a situation one day where we had a couple of our, our subordinate commanders get into a little bit of a tiff. Hey, I have the right to do this because, you know, I'm, I, I work on the airplanes and, and you, you just take care of the base. And it was interesting dynamic happening. And I looked at both of them and I said, guys, we're on the same team. I need you both to get along and work together. Whatever one gets, the other has the same right because we are all making this mission happen together. And I knew how important that was. Well, if you think about the, the uh, Global Strike Command, you helped to lead 30,000 men and women there. If you think about the 509th Bomb Wing, 8,500 folks that you led there. Your grandfather died in 2007, so he, he got to see some of this. He, he knew where you were headed. He had to be very proud. How did he, how did he manifest that? How did he share um, his pride in what you were doing? That's a great question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that before, but my grandfather was a very private person. Yeah. I don't know that he ever really told me that he loved me, which was interesting, right? But everybody else told me that he did. Yeah. That's how he shared it. He would tell other people, one day we were going to fly in the B-29. I'd never flown in this magnificent airplane that we have flying today called Fifi. It belongs to the Commemorative Air Force. And they said, Paul, uh, to me, they said, Paul, we're going to put you and your grandfather in the airplane together. I said, he's not going to do it. He gave up flying years ago. And they uh, talked to him, and one thing led to another, and we ended up flying in that airplane together because he and I had mutual respect for one another, right? I, uh, he's my hero, but he looked at me and said, Paul, you know, I'm so proud of you, but he wouldn't tell me it, right? He would just tell others. Yeah. Leadership, right? You are doing consulting work now. I think you spent some time flying for FedEx in your post-military career very successfully. Doing in Baton Rouge now, doing some leadership consulting and some corporate consulting. The whole idea of leadership fascinates me. And if you think about military leadership and how that translates to today's business culture, what do you know about that? And, and what can you share with executives in terms of leadership that can help their organizations be more successful. You know, I, we talked about teaming already and we talked about taking care of your people, critical. And taking care of your people means that you invest in them and you understand what their needs are. But I will tell you one of the big things that it was important to me, I learned from my grandfather and played out my career was balance in our lives. And how, how do you do these great things and, and still take care of your family? Because so many military guys say on their way out, 
I'm leaving the military with the same wife I came in or same spouse I came in with. And you think, oh, that's just, you know, no, it's, it's know, a big deal. It's a big deal. Right. But that means investing in your family. And so for me, as an example, you know, I, I tried to put time with my son. I got him through Eagle Scout, my daughter and her, her sports, my wife doing things together because it's easy to just work and not think of, not remember that you've got to invest that T-I-M-E in those that you love. And my grandfather was very clear about that. You know, he said, if you don't spend that time, you can't make it up later. And so really that was one of the big ones for us. And the other one that he shared with me many, many times was learning from failure and applying that forward. We're all gonna make mistakes, um, lots of them, because we're not perfect. And he, he shared many times where he said, Paul, I, the tack thing, I, mm, I should have done this, I should have done, you know, but I learned from that, right? Well, I did the same thing I mentioned before about some stumbles or areas that when I was a junior commander that I learned from to apply when I was a wing commander, right? I think if we can always be in a learning mode, if we can always take those things that we've, we've seen, we've done, we've experienced and apply those forward, then that's what will allow us to be more successful in the future while the entire time remain, remain, you know, keeping in mind that our life is not just our work. Our life is that balance of what are the things that are important to you, right? And applying time and energy to those things. And those are the things that can distinguish real leaders from others. If someone's watching this show today, Paul, and they want to get in touch with you, maybe to pick your brain or have your consulting services, talk about leadership within their organization, what do they do? Well, thanks, Tim, for asking that. I have a website. It's very simple. PaulWTibbets.com. P-A-U-L-W-T-I-B-B-E-T-S.com. Listen, man, it has been my great pleasure. I have, I have enjoyed studying your grandfather and learning about the heroic mission that he, he led. It's been a great honor to meet you. Thank you for the service that you have provided to our country in a very distinguished way. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, maybe having you back on the show sometime next year. Well, it's an honor to be here, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a wrap, guys. Thanks for joining us in our ninth season of the Louisiana Business and Industry Show.